Um, all right, so for our next talk, uh, patching, it's complicated by Cheryl Biswas. Is that? Um, so, uh, and I've seen this time and time again with lots of different customers where it's easy for us as the security guys to come in and say something like, hey, you just got to keep it patched, right? That's, it's just simple. Just they turn on Windows Update and it'll get patched and everything will be cool, right? No, it's not that easy. And I've had plenty of discussions with people on bar napkins and all that kind of fun stuff about the complexities of, of um, you know, being able to patch, you know, just an, a huge enterprise that's around the world. And so this evening... Uh, we have Cheryl Biswas with here that's going to, I think, introduce a lot of people to how complex this can be in a big enterprise. So with that, Cheryl, it's all you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm just going to put this right up. First of all, it's wonderful to be here. I'm so excited to get to talk at Firetalks at ShmooCon. I am thrilled to have this panel and to get to meet some of the people who have really influenced and shaped my career here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to weigh in and share your wisdom and your humor. Okay, patching. It is complicated, yes. So I have wanted to give this talk for a long time. And given current events and developments, I think that there's no better time than the present. So why patching? Well, it's a pain point for all of us. And it's a pain in the ass, but it's also a necessary evil. So it's also a highly contentious and even a divisive situation that arises in our community time and again. Now, we learned some very hard lessons last year with WannaCry about outdated and unpatched systems with the spread of ransomware globally, but particularly and perhaps poignantly with how it impacted hospitals and shut them down. So you could say, quite literally, that unpatched systems would be the death of us. Now, ironically, that was not a first case of ransomware going through the hospitals. If you think back to February of 2016, that was when we saw a very interesting pivot in terms of the development of ransomware. And there were unpatched, outdated middleware systems running JBoss. And this happened to be a vulnerability that was exploitable, that was noted and circulated online, but nothing was done at the time. So I took to heart, and I really liked what Bruce Potter had to say this afternoon in his rather eloquent rant. Just patch your shit? <laughs> well, no, it isn't really that easy. And the problem is we get into a blame game scenario because we like to point the finger and pass it off and blame somebody for it. But that's not getting to the root cause of the issues. So yeah, it has been one hell of a year. We have got Eternal Blue. We have got WannaCry and Apache Struts. Not once, not twice, but I do believe three times. And then, oh my God. Spectre, Spectre and Meltdown, yes. But what have we learned from having to go through these? I can't reiterate. There's been enough published about it. So I'm going to go on to where does it hurt? What are our pain points and my code blues to share? I have had to do a lot of work on security audits. Has anybody had the pleasure here? <laughs> 
<laughs> audits and assessments, yes. And when you're talking to people in business about their business, you hear some interesting rationales as to why they don't patch. I rather like the one that, well, we're following this particular feed from this particular online source, and so we're good, really. We don't have to do it more often than this, no matter what you say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> keep telling yourself that. But what it comes down to, and I've watched this from having worked in a, I started off with a managed security, managed services provider, and they were a Windows-based shop. Guys fixing servers for very small businesses. And really, that's the backbone of our industry, isn't it? These are these small businesses, and sometimes even um, if you're thinking of do-good services, like Habitat for Humanity, they don't have budget and they don't have manpower. So if patches go wrong, these guys aren't really going to be able to come back from it quite so resiliently. It's hard to patch. It isn't a straightforward process. I've, <laughs> I've seen guys lose hair permanently over it. Then you have to deal with the fact that, well, nobody's wanting to take ownership on the issues. You have to fight with the guys above you, you have to fight with the guys you're working with, and then you have to deal with the disgruntled user population. And then there's an overall lack of accountability because really nobody wants to have to do this and when stuff goes bad, nobody wants this to stick to them. That's the corporate enterprise culture. But patching is supposed to be a fundamental part of our security best practices. So it comes to us as to how can we make this better and doable for ourselves and for the people that we serve. Well, let's talk about managing releases. Okay, so we've got staggered releases, we've got previews, and then we've got supersedence. And if you're not confused by that, <laughs> I was. So how do we manage downtime with uptime? How do we get all of the stakeholders informed and on board and signed off on and the change management people put in and the timing right? And then, of course, there's the joy of how do you manage which release you have? Because have you looked at, <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but I have looked at spreadsheets and literally gone cross-eyed trying to figure out where we are in terms of what, in accordance with what maybe Oracle has to say, maybe Windows has to say, because you have to manage the patches across the board. And that for the user community, that for the support community, is a major pain point. So WannaCry served as a huge wake-up call for everybody, for those who weren't patching, but also for those of us who are to say, are we doing it as well as we think we are? And the reality is this, we are damned if we do and we are damned if we don't. If anybody here follows Wendy Nather, I, I like what she has to say because I consider her to be a voice of reason and very experienced in our community. Last May, she did an interesting thread and she invited the community to weigh in on the pain points and the realities of why you're not patching, why it's just not feasible. Conversely, Swift on Security gives an excellent representation on the blue side of things and the importance of good defense practices. For her, it's a representation of what are your keystones and patching is one of them. And it comes down to this, is the cure worse than the disease? And if we are going to pay for that ounce of prevention, can we really pay that cost? Well, as they say, the road to hell. So who here has lived through the joys of a bad patch Tuesday? Oh God, yes, <laughs> oh my God. Because when it goes wrong, it goes so very, very wrong. I know, I have taken those triage calls. <laughs> yeah, so Windows, as we know, has had, it, it has a litany of bad patch Tuesdays. In fact, multiple months of bad patch Tuesdays, and I don't want to tell you what happens when Outlook goes sideways, and you have to really hide the phone because it's just ringing so much. Yeah, because actually stuff breaks. 
the customers are really upset because business is down. And it, it isn't just a simple fact of roll it back because it isn't straightforward, just as patches aren't straightforward. So the problem we have here is this has given business a really hard and effective argument as to, in terms of money and risk, why they aren't going to follow the patching schedules that we recommend, but they're going to do it on their time, on their dime. Oh my God, that brings us to the show of the moment, Spectre and Meltdown. I, what can I say that hasn't already been published? But every day brings fresh new horrors, right? <laughs> Only it, it is so much more than just the fact that we are losing speed processing time and perhaps other unknown complications. What we're also seeing here is the impact it's having on ICS, industrial control systems, and critical infrastructure which are rather important in our daily lives. They're not dealing, these systems, which are proprietary and specialized, are not dealing well with this latest round of emergency patches at all. And in my take, that stuff breaks. So if critical infrastructure isn't taking this well, then the impact is gonna be rather critical to us. I like, uh, I like a lot of different defense and security podcasts. One of my favorites is Defense and Security. I listen to what Jerry Bell has to say because he has worked in compliance and patching is a keystone of that. He noted with regard to uh, Spectre and Meltdown that the complexity of this solution is really what's going to be our undoing. It's gonna create for us new exploits as well as self-inflicted wounds from not knowing how to do it and being in a rush. And the truth of these, these vulnerabilities, as in many other cases, is that the, the haste to make waste concept, they didn't know at the time and they wanted to create something and get it to market fast. And now we're dealing with the un, unknown consequences. Well, we don't wanna do that same haste makes waste approach in terms of the mitigation. Oh my God, <sighs> the internet of things. Okay, why? Why in God's name does everything have to connect? But, but it does. And so in this rush to create the next consumable commercial item, we seem to have left security completely by the wayside. For example, passwords are, are default if we're lucky, embedded if we're not, and God forbid we have to fix a problem in the BIOS or any glitches in the firmware, because that's pretty much impossible. So from industrial webcams, hello Mirai botnet, to the family crock pot, we are dealing with a legion of doom. <laughs> yes. And that brings me to this. First, I really wanna give a shout out and a sincere thank you to the people who have been leading the charge to bring this to the forefront. So um, Josh Corman and the, I am the Cavalry Brigade and Yelena and Adi, thank you. Please keep doing the good work you're doing. The prognosis, yeah. Because the prognosis is grim <laughs> and we know that because this is specialized critical infrastructure for critical care, right? So we're talking about heart, insulin pumps, pacemakers. Only the downtime for patching versus the downtime for fixing whatever patching broke is a very real concern here. And yes, from whatever devices, pacemakers, etc., we don't understand the complexities and the intricacies of the medical community and hospital environments. We're telling them what they should be doing, but the reality is we can't prescribe. We're not the doctors who have to live with this. So when MRI scanners get hit with ransomware because they're running on outdated, outmoded systems, we need resuscitation. But that's gonna cost manpower, money, and legislation. It's not really happening. Okay, sorry, I was a diehard for a fan, I had to include this. <laughs> okay. 
Welcome to the world of ICS and SCADA, mission critical. This is the stuff that runs our daily lives. But operational tech is prior, it's proprietary, and when it goes down, it goes down hard. The ethos here is we don't patch it because we're going to break it. So we're going to run it to failure, and then we're going to replace it. And then here's another very proprietary world, the world of mainframe systems. Anybody who works on mainframes, show of hands. Yeah. So you know you don't touch the mainframe. And why? Because it's all about high availability, millions of transactions per minute. And, <laughs> and global finance. So yes, Virginia, I come from a mainframe shop, and there are scheduled outages. Because if you have unscheduled outages, really, really bad things happen, like maybe global economic meltdowns. But there's always hope, and there are great voices in our community who are encouraging us that there are things we can do and mitigate and find ways to do this better. Because best practices list has more than one option. So I'm going to leave this with you. If we want to help management hear the message, we need to write a new prescription for patching. What we need is a second opinion. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah, w one question, just because this guy looks very assertive, so. This is apologetic bullshit. Windows XP is over 15 years old. Seriously, like, we don't expect schools that, that you send your kid to to keep the asbestos in there. We tell them to take it out. We should ask them to take this shit out of the hospital. Like, I can't, yeah, I know. That's a message, and you would have thought they had heard it with Wanna Cry with ransomware in the hospitals. I totally agree. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, thank you for your, thank you. We all agree. <laughs> all right. Um, so thank you, Cheryl. It's, yeah, um, Cheryl. Okay, I'm gonna rock it through this judging because all this bribery is starting to take a toll. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. All right. Plus one for patching is a pain in the ass. God's honest truth, and thank you for saying it. Um, plus one for fire in nearly every slide. Fire talk. Fire talks. Yeah, she got it. Yep. Okay, uh, plus one, the just patch your shit, you know, it, it, the Bruce Potter quote. Because honestly, it is not that simple. Having worked at the uh, giant mega corporation, largest software company in the world for seven years, one of the most enlightening things I ever heard was from a customer who literally said, for all of our corporate enterprise environment, yes, we have auto updates and, and we manage the patching. For our core business, we air gap it and we leave that thing running on XP. And guess what? They expected that thing to be running on XP for 50 years. So even a CISO, a CISO, who, um, yeah, I know, right? I'll drink anyway. Don't worry about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the point is, sometimes it's the deployer, not the vendor, in certain cases, um, that, that is impeding security. Uh, where was I? Okay, plus two for quoting Wendy Nather uh, so much. She is one of, honestly, she is one of the wisest, kindest, and most experienced former CISOs, CISOs ever. I don't know how she pronounces it, and honestly, she can do whatever she wants. She's awesome. Um, Plus one for expressing the, lack, uh, expressing the lack of ownership and accountability for patch and upkeep. I mean, I think that's been a central theme for a lot of what we've talked about tonight. Plus one for the complexity of the situation, uh, or the complexity of solution worse than the issue. And again, this is, this is going back to the, the idea of the, the 
the security of a network or a device is not dependent on any one entity. And that's really what it is. And we, we've got a lack of, of accountability. Um, I had to ding you, though. I mean, you were going on a roll. But it's a minus two for the myth that the FDA must recertify medical devices for every patch. That is actually a myth that Suzanne Schwartz, Dr. Suzanne Schwartz, has been trying to myth bust that because that is what medical device manufacturers have been using as an excuse to be like, yeah, that's a totally huge, horrible security vulnerability and we would have to recertify so we can't fix it. So that, that needs to be myth busted and I needed, to, I needed to ding you on that one. So plus seven minus two equals five. Just, Very good. Just uh, one question, is Sec Barbie in the house? All right, all right, all right, I'm just making sure. Good. I'm not really sure what that was about, but anyway. Okay, very good. Um, <laughs> so um, I, th I think you really highlighted something that we underappreciate. You know, sometimes people say, hey, this is just really about cyber hygiene and, and you know, here are five things, sorry folks, I, I, maybe those are bad words, but that's what you hear often. And, and, just, and just, you know, patching is number one and, and just get it done, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, um, when you talk with people one-on-one, -on -one, patching is hard, patching is hard, patching is hard, patching is hard. So um, giving those real world examples, I think, is really Im important to, to getting people to actually um, working on this critical problem. So thank you for the highlight on that, um, because it is a really hard problem. Um. I, I just, it, it's just a very serious thing. It, it's a lot harder. I mean, just like I talked about whenever we, whenever I introduced you, it, it isn't as simple. And, and so I, I just want to thank you for shedding light and, and on that. Um, and then I love, and, and I think Katie said this too, but is the cure worse than the disease? I mean, just. Good point. Just so many good points. I spent most of my time like just copying Katie's notes, so so I agree with her. No, but I wish I would have sat next to Donna. Science. But eh, anyway, <laughs> no. So, um, but I just want to thank you. You did a wonderful job. Um, I think that's all I have. Can't wait to hear more. Thank you. Thank you. All right.